Let's get into the word of God. Amen. First Samuel chapter 16, uh, verses 12 and 13. We have your Bible. Say amen. Word of God says, starting with verse 12, it says, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. This is talking about David. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to delve into your word just a bit deeper. Wow, Father, you have something to teach us today, and we can't wait to understand it for ourselves. Make that our reality. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So this is how we ended last week. It's, it's David being anointed. This sounds great. It almost sounds like because he's been anointed to be the king of Israel that he's about to walk into the throne room the next minute, right? I mean, that's what I would assume. I still have the, the fragrance of the oil on my head. I would just roll up into the throne room and say, Saul, <laughs> there's a new sheriff in town. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Chapter 16, verse 14. Chapter 16, verse 14 says, Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let's go down to verse 16. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play with the he will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon him, and you will will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. Verse 18 says, one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play this harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. And the Lord is what? The Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. All right, we can stop there. Who is with the sheep. Wow. Okay, can we unpack this just for a little bit? (laughs) So David got anointed as king, and he went back to sheep herding? That was, that was his next assignment. He's anointed as the future king of Israel and his first assignment as the new king of Israel is to herd sheep. How do you, how, how, how do you do this? How can you be elected as the president of the United States and then go back to working at In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> I mean, like, real, real talk. How can you be anointed, called, I mean, blessed, uh, prophesied over? You, you know what your future is, and your next assignment is flipping veggie burgers. I know you all eat veggie burgers. Come on now. How do, we, how do we go from this, this moment of, of achievement? I mean, come on, Matt, you, you just graduated from USC yesterday. You now have your doctorate. Can you imagine entering kindergarten this Monday? Can you imagine that? David goes back to herding sheep. So there's something going on here, because I'm going to be honest with you. Growing up, I was a very impatient kid, extremely impatient. I was an impatient teenager as well. I was an impatient adult. I'm an, I've been an impatient pastor. I'm not anymore. I'm cured. I'm not anymore. Trust me on this. It's all done. But I've been an impatient person all of my life. And it's very difficult. In fact, the the most dreaded words I could ever hear hear is, wait your turn. Playing video games, right? It's my turn, it's my turn, wait your turn. 
And I, I had two other brothers. Later on, I had a, a third brother. And so, you know, sometimes there was a little bit of a log jam trying to play Super Mario Brothers. Wait your turn. Wait your turn. I could not stand that command. Wait your turn. But this is our challenge, right? Remember how it was we couldn't wait to drive for the first time? We couldn't wait to get our license? That was so exciting until your friends never gave you gas money. <laughs> Remember what it was like when you were in college and you were like, oh, I just cannot wait to enter the workforce. I'm so tired of papers. I'm so tired of these tests. I'm so tired of the cafeteria. And then you enter the workforce and you've been at it for a year. And what are you longing for? Wishing you were going back to college. Those days were so much easier. Or this one. I just can't wait to get married. I can't wait to get married and have children, and I want three kids, and I want this kind of house with the picket fence. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to have the best neighbors. And then you get exactly what you prayed for. Right? We've all been there, impatient, impatient, and some of us rushing, rushing to that finish line, wanting what we believe that we're deserved. How many of you have lost your patience at work because you should have been the one promoted? You're the one with the degrees. You're the one that has the experience. You're the one that should be next in line, yet it was given to someone else that you are certain was less qualified. And here you are back in your cubicle, but you're the one that has the pedigree. You're the one that is qualified. Boy, I'm telling you, it is extremely, extremely difficult. But here's the funny part. Most of us, as much as we might say, admit that we are impatient, many of us are not impatient in every aspect of our life. I've never met somebody that has put their, their, their TV dinner in the microwave and set the timer for four minutes, but then 15 seconds into it, they say, I just can't wait, I just can't wait, and take it out. Why would no one ever do that? The, the dinner would not be any good, right? I've never seen anyone, you know, baking a pizza and like five minutes into it, they're like, you know what? I cannot wait for this pizza. I'm taking it out right now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna, to gobble it all down right now. You wouldn't do that. It wouldn't taste right. We have some of these examples for children's story. I remember when Nathan was in utero on his way. I had the, the, the app, you know, that, that I was counting down the weeks. 40 weeks. Can you imagine? That's a long time. 40 weeks to wait for a kid? But I could not wait. I remember getting to week 30. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. I can see that bump now. I was talking to Nate. Come on, guy. You can do this. I never was tempted ever to say, you know what, Iris, we're going to take him out right now. Never tempted. Not Why would I not want to take him out early? He would have been underdeveloped, right? Certain things we just won't have a problem. I have yet to see somebody who is so impatient that they exit the freeway before there's actually an exit. Now listen, we're laughing at this because all of these sound ridiculous, right? We're laughing. Right, but this is also, believe it or not, should be applied to even these parts of our life that we're impatient about. Some of our decisions, honestly, some of our decisions in work and even in relationships look just as rushed as someone exiting the freeway before the exit actually comes up. Because one thing we have to understand here is that the will of God, it's, 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 we, we want to be in the will of God, but the will of God is also a timing issue. The will of God is a timing issue as well. In other words, God could select the person like Moses and say that he was going to deliver his children out of, out of bondage, but if we are not in the right timing of God, no matter if you're the one that God is willing to be the leader, willing to be the director, willing to match up with that person, if it's not in the right timing, you can mess it all up. Just Moses, for example. Now, the Bible 
kind of speaks on this. This is Stephen during his trial. Stephen starts talking about the history of Israel, and he just, he just blasts Moses. He says, Moses thought because of his military prowess, because of his time working with the Egyptian generals, because he knew he had all of the intellect, he thought that after taking out that one Egyptian, that all of the Hebrew slaves would follow him. He was like, I got this, guys. I just want you to know my mom has been telling me I'm special from day one, that I'm the man. And once he got to a certain age, he's like, it is time. I'm in my 40s. I've read, I've read that you don't really start living till your 40s, so I am ready to deliver you guys right now. He takes out an Egyptian in anger, and he realizes nobody wants to follow him. And what did Moses do? He ran for his life. He spent another 40 years in the microwave. Another 40 years traveling down the freeway. Another 40 years in the oven cooking. Another 40 years. And you know what? Had he just waited two more years, it might have been the perfect time. Moses might have delivered his people by being the prince of Egypt. Do I need to say that again? Moses might have delivered his people by simply being the prince of Egypt. It could have been a political delivery. It could have been him gaining influence among, among the Egyptians, and that is how he wins the favor of Pharaoh. Nope. My man decided to be on like the FBI's most wanted. So God is like, Moses, clearly you have a temper issue. So we're going to cook you a little bit longer. I'm going to make you a shepherd. You're going to be working it in and out for 40 years. Uh, my apologies for anybody that works it in and out. It's, that's not, it's not, I'm not trying to say that sheep herding is a really good job. You know, when you think of, okay, all right. I'm going to get a lot of emails this week. So it's really interesting when we, when we think about this is that, is that, is that, is that there are situations, there are situations that demand time, demand us being patient. And if I can be vulnerable for a moment, if I can just be vulnerable for a moment, even in my own personal life, you know, five, about five and a half years ago, I was asked to be the pastor here at Vallejo Drive. Do you know that? Some of you don't know that. Some were in that meeting. Some were in that meeting, and I had a choice to make. And there were some people that said, you better take that job. You better. It's Vallejo Drive. It's right across from the conference. I don't know how that makes it any better. For me, that's a little bit scarier, right? But I was told by people uh, uh, of great standing, just do it. I said, well, wait a second, you know, my family, there, people are working here, and there's this, and there's all this other kind of stuff, and there was stuff that was going internally in my family, and had I made that decision just following people's advice, it would have been the wrong time. And I don't think we would have the same circumstances, the same hope, the same, the same bright future. I really don't, because there were things in me that I didn't realize that still needed to be cooked. And I said, Lord, it, although it seems right, it seems right, I need to wait for you to tell me to go. And God didn't tell me to go. Now looking back, I realize that it was necessary for me to spend another five years, necessary for me to spend time at my grandparents' church, Vallejo Central, necessary for me to be there, things that God had to work on. I'm telling you, there's an impatience issue even within me. Relationships that I believe that God called, uh, 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 that, God, that God ordained. Relationships that I know that I believe by seeing signs and God answering prayers. But again, if you rush the timing, rush the timing, no matter how ordained the relationship is, if it doesn't come together in the timing of God, you can mess things up. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. And so here we are in this story, David going back to being a sheep herder. And the interesting thing is, is that we often look at that situation almost as if it's a, a demotion. David should be upset. David should have a, a problem. But I want to I present to you something that I think 
is life transforming. I want to present to you something. The Bible describes love as being patient. You guys know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? It is the first time that love is actually defined in the Bible. The first time love is defined in the Bible is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The next time it's defined is in 1 John when John says that God is love, right? God is love. But the first time it's defined in the Bible, the first word used to define love is that love is patient. And so I am going to present to you today that the heart of a champion is a heart that is patient. And there's a reason to be patient, right? As there is a reason for us not to exit the freeway before an exit, there is a reason to be patient. As there is a reason not to rush the process when your little baby is just getting cooked in the womb, there's a reason not to rush that process. There's a reason not to take the pizza out too early in the oven. I am going to present to you today that there is a reason for being patient, and I want to give you Three reasons. Can we do that? The first reason, the first reason, the first reason for patience and having patience, and I believe that God is doing something special in David's life here. The reason that he goes back to being a sheep herder, he's going back to to shepherding, is for perspective. Patience gives you perspective. Patience gives you perspective. I always ask myself this question, why was David not included in the original lineup? Did you ever ask that question? Why was David not included in the original lineup? When Samuel came to look at Jesse's boys, David was the one that was out there still working with the sheep. And after he goes through all the sons of Jesse, he says, is there not another one? None of these God has chosen. I have heard some pastors actually say it was because David was the runt. Of his brothers. He was the runt, the little guy. Nobody wanted him, right? He was always picked last on the team. But we've already read up to this point. He's a strong man. He's a good looking man. He's a musician. He's a warrior, right? David doesn't sound like any runt. I've heard some preachers even suggest that David wasn't even Jesse's kid because of the way that the, the, the Hebrew describes him as being ruddy, reddish. Right? They think, well, it's not talking about his complexion, it's talking about his hair. He was a redhead. Sorry, redheads, I'm not, uh, you are anointed. (laughs) What I'm saying is that they believe it's a description of his hair, that he's a redhead, and that Jesse didn't like him because possibly the, listen, there's kids here, I don't want to get messy. All I'm saying, that's weird. That anybody would even come to that conclusion, especially given the fact that David had to come from that line of Jesse, right? Literally. This is the, 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 the messianic line. So there, there shouldn't have been any kind of brokenness, right? This, any disconnection. It should literally come from Jesse's line. But, but that's what they believe because no one can figure out why David wasn't included, But can I just suggest something else? If you spend time with the text, there might be other reasons why David wasn't included. Could it be that the father said, that's my little boy. He's too young. He's not ready. Right? Couldn't it have been that? Could the reason have been that he is the best shepherd ever in Bethlehem? Did you hear the story about what he did to the bear and the lion? No shepherd has ever displayed so many skills. Right, think about it. David is this, like, all-star shepherd. He's a, he's a warrior, and he's like a world-class musician. And he's good-looking. He's hot. Right? So he has all this stuff going for him, and it could be that Jesse's like, uh, that's my moneymaker. <laughs> you ain't taking him. The beautiful thing about being patient, taking your time with the text, taking your time in a situation, is if you give yourself enough time, you can have perspective. I know a lot of people that jump to conclusions because they don't take enough time really looking at all of the factors, right? Well, where were you? Well, I called, and it went straight to voicemail. You must have turned your phone off. Actually, I I went through a dead spot. It's the spot that always cuts. You just have to take your time. Don't rush. Patience gives us time for perspective. We become better listeners when we're patient. 
I've heard some people say, do not go to sleep while you're angry. Don't. You, you saw the argument right now. No, absolutely not. That is the worst advice. Go to bed angry. If you must. Because you know what happens during the night? Your mind still processes. It's still figuring things out. The emotions come down. You settle down a bit. In the morning, you wake up and you go, I don't even know why I was so upset. You know, I might have just been hangry. I might have just been sleep deprived. And now I have more perspective. I have more clarity. Now let's talk about it again. Okay, it's all right if your mother comes. It's just that, right? Right, you have, you have perspective. Happy Mother's Day, mother-in-laws. Happy Mother's Day, right? You have perspective. Listen, sometimes, sometimes you just have to just, hey, honey, honey, I really want to hear you, but right now it's elevated. I know you don't like going to sleep angry because uh, you feel insecure, like I'm, I'm abandoning you. I want to solve this problem, but right now I am so afraid. Right now I am so emotional. I can't hear you the way that I need to hear you. Let's take a time out. Let's just take a time out. Let's go to sleep. Let me have perspective, right? Amen? All right. Patience gives us time to have perspective. And I believe that this is exactly what David needed to do. And when you have time for perspective, we don't fill the silent spaces with juicy assumptions, right? You notice that when you don't have, when you have some silence and there's some dead space, I can tell you exactly why they didn't respond to my text. I'm going to tell you exactly why they left me on red. Don't fill in those spaces. Give it time. Do you know how many times I've jumped to conclusions? They're probably upset with me right now. And then they'll say, I'm so sorry I was stuck in a meeting. Oh, that's the reason why. I thought you were upset with what I text, right? Give it time. And I think that because we want to fill these silent spaces, we'll come up with stuff like David must have been a redhead and not Jesse's son. Give it time. If you read the story, you'll realize that David was respected by his father and his brothers. Well, there's one brother that had a little bit of issue with him, but again, he's mostly respected by his family, his, his, his countrymen. Let's continue on. Patience. Number two, patience gives us time to develop. Patience gives us time to develop. Just as Moses learned a lot in those 40 years being a shepherd, David still had more to learn being a shepherd. That's why after the anointing, he goes back to shepherding. Just because God foretold that he would be the future king did not mean that David didn't have any more lessons to learn. I got a lesson for some people out there. Just because you got that promotion and you're now the director does not mean you still don't have room to grow and to learn. Just because now you own your own business, just because now you have your own doc doctorate, right? Just because you now have your own PhD, just because you're now married doesn't mean that you have landed, that you have accomplished everything. There is still more to learn. Some people don't even know who their spouse is until they get married. Hello? Marriage is not the end. Marriage is the beginning. Some of you have been married for 30 years are saying, I'm still getting to know who this joker is. <laughs> Patience gives us time to develop. So we take our time. We realize that we are always a canvas. Just because you've had success in one part of your life or at this one particular job or at this one church doesn't mean you're going to have the same measure of success at the next stop. We must always be open to learn. Lord, teach me. If I have to go back to being a janitor, if I have to go back to working on this particular aspect in my life, I will do whatever it takes, Lord, because you are developing me, and I don't want to rush that process. The Bible tells us that God will finish the work that he has begun in us. Amen? God will finish this work. This happens in very practical and meaningful ways. The more time for de development gives us, the more time to develop sensitivity and empathy. Isn't that beautiful? 
You can't lead people that you don't understand. David couldn't lead anyone when he doesn't understand. Now watch this, watch this. So this is what happens. We're going back to our text. We're going back to our text. Watch what happens here with this time. So remember, they search out for David, right? They want David to, uh, to help the king out because of this evil spirit. And can I just say this? A theology 101 lesson here. The evil spirit did not come from God. The evil spirit did not come from God. God does not have an evil spirit. There are no evil spirits that are employed by God. God does not work with evil. Evil cannot come from good. Are you guys listening? Right? A good tree does not bear bad fruit. The reason why the Bible words it that way is because I believe that just like all humanity, even the authors of the Bible books are also imperfect. Oh, you didn't like the way that sounds. We as Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in word inspiration. We believe in thought inspiration. That is not my own uh, concoction. I'm not just making that up out of thin air. We believe in thought inspiration, not word inspiration, meaning that there are some words that are placed in some interesting places in, in the word. The author of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel doesn't seem to have the full picture of the great controversy. And we'll have the author of Chronicles that will come behind the author of, of 1 and 2 Samuel and say, yeah, I think it should be worded a little bit differently. We have more time for that later, not for today. But I just want you to know, evil does not come from God. The author believed because an evil spirit came upon Saul that it must have been, again, God's divine perfect will, so he gave all of the responsibility to God, but that's not what's happening. Saul made a decision. He pushed God away, and God stepped back, and when God steps back, all hell breaks loose. The evil spirit is Satan, and God does not employ Satan. So I want you to watch what happens here. So we're going back here. We're going back here. We're in uh, uh, verse 20, it says, so Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, a young goat, and sent them uh, with his son to, to uh, son David to Saul. Verse 21 says, David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. And David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service, for I am what? I am pleased with him. Whenever the spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take up his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Can I just share something with you really quick on this whole idea of perspective? I mean, not perspective, but time to develop, patience and time to develop. David was able to be employed by Saul, and he had firsthand experience in the very throne room of the king. Are you, guys, are you guys catching this? Before David ever became king, he had an eye and an ear in the throne of the king. He was the armor bearer of the king. He would hear conversations that were going. David was learning on the job what not to do and what to do. Not all of Saul was bad. Come on, let's keep it real here. He was king for 42 years. Not all of Saul was bad. So David was learning. As he was still a shepherd, right, Learning in the field, he was then taken and employed by Saul, working for the king. And David was getting the on-job experience. You see how important it is? Patience gives us time to do what? Time to develop. God was developing David during this time. There, would, there was no need to rush to be king because David still had a lot to learn about being a king. And some of you know this from experience. You've learned from your boss sometimes what not to do and what to do. Here's our last point, and we're closing. Here's our last point. Here's our last point. Patience gives us time to forgive. Patience gives us time to forgive. Now, you're going to tell me, Pastor, where, where is that in the story? Where in the world is that in the story? Watch this. Watch this. This period that David was waiting to be king wasn't just about what he needed to learn. This time period after David was anointed, waiting to be king, was also God developing Saul. Watch this. 
God, after anointing David, knowing that David would succeed Saul, still was working on Saul's heart. I told you, I told you, I do not like, I do not like the phrase, I do not like the phrase, wait your turn, wait your turn. But I want you to think about this for a second. God also is waiting, waiting for Saul's turn. Forgiveness in the Hebrew, forgiveness in Hebrew, literally, it's teshuva, literally means to turn back, to turn back or to return. The reason why God delays, the reason why God waits, even when he passes judgment, saying, Saul, bruh, I got it, it's, we, we done, bruh, we done, we done, we done, we done. But the reason why God still waits is because God gives us time to turn back back. Wait your turn. Is God also waiting for you to turn? Patience gives us opportunity to forgive. Think about it. Think about it. Those times where you thought to yourself, I will never forgive her. I will never forgive him. I will never forgive what they did to me. It, it was cruel. It was, it was unusual. It was unfair. And watch what happens in time. Patience allows us opportunities for perspective, allows us opportunities to develop, and most importantly in these spaces, gives us enough time to forgive. And no one knows that better than God, right? Right? In 40 days, Nineveh, in 40 days, you will be overturned. In 40 days. That was a long 40 days, right? But what was happening in Nineveh those 40 days? Oh, they were developing, weren't they? <laughs> were they gaining perspective? The prophet Nahum calls them the city of blood, but they were gaining perspective and they repented and they said, maybe perhaps God will relent from bringing about this disaster. And so they turned back. They repented, the Bible says. And so in chapter 3, verse 10, it says that God also then turned. God is waiting for your turn. He's waiting for your turn. He's waiting for my turn. Patience gives God opportunity, ample opportunity to work on our hearts. Second Peter says this, and we close on this. Second Peter says this, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What we learn about that word in the Greek, everyone, means what? It means everyone. God's patient because he's waiting your turn. He's waiting for your turn. Family, there's someone here today, someone here today that has yet to turn. You have tried to skip the process. You are so impatient. You, ref you, re you refuse to see anyone else's perspective. You already know it. You've judged it. You know you have it all down. You don't want any more time to develop. And as a result, you remain an unfinished product. And God wants to use you. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless your relationship. He wants to bless your situation at school. He wants to bless you at your work. He wants to do so much more, but you're unwilling to be patient enough for God to do his work in you. So God is saying, yeah, wait your turn. I'm waiting for you to turn. God was waiting on Saul. God is waiting on me. And God is waiting on you. There's someone here today that wants to make that stand. You want to simply say, Lord, I hear you, and I want to turn back. I don't want my anger to lead me. I don't want my fears to lead me. I don't want my prejudice to lead me. 
I don't want my egotism to leave me. I want that fruit of the Spirit that you promise us, patience. But I can be the woman, be the man you're calling me to be. The heart of a champion is a patient heart. If that is who you are, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. Father, thank you so much for the reminder again that you want so much more from us. And you want so much more from us because you want so much more for us. So Lord, we're going to take our impatient selves and we're going to put our trust in you. Take your time. Don't pull us out of the oven too early. We want to develop. We want to be what you've called us to be. We want, to, we want to be patient so that we have perspective, patient so that we have time to develop. We want to be patient so that we can ultimately, ultimately forgive others and to really experience the fullness of what it means to be forgiven by you. We want the heart of the champion, a heart that is patient. In Jesus' name.